Married for 37 years, Ken and Lisa minister in the USA, Brazil, Russia, Israel, and are called to save the nations. Lisa, born from the Gentile nations into a family of pastors, and Ken, a New Yorker born from Jewish parents. At his bar mitzvah, those who heard Ken speak say he is destined to be a rabbi. Together, they teach how to practically walk in the Hebrew Christian roots of the faith and the revelation of Torah with the prophetic revelation and the power of the Spirit. It's time to hit the mark. We receive it. Oh, Lord, we just lift up right now our nation. We receive it for our nation right now, the reign of God right now. Oh, I come against the forces of the enemy over our nation, all this discord. Lord, we just, we come against it as the people of God. We take our rightful place and we speak to the atmosphere. And Lord, we stand in the gap. You said my people are called by my name. If we humble ourselves, we pray and we repent. So, Lord, Lord, we repent right now for racism. I repent. I repent. I stand in the gap for this nation right now, God. That there will be, God, a healing in our land, Lord. A change, a shift right now. Oh, Father, people are hurting, and you are the answer. You're the only one. It is the Holy Spirit, the Ruach Kadesh. You're the only one that can transform us, that can change us, God. Oh, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. I pray, God, all over this nation. Lord, I pray for spiritual authority to take the rightful place. The true spiritual authority. The sons and daughters of God that are placed in cities all over this nation that you have called, that you have set apart, that you've given them the authority to stand in their city and take the authority. Oh, and command peace, shalom, and Holy Ghost fire. Holy Ghost fire. Lord, we come against the counter counterfeit, the counterfeit of the natural fires. We break Satan's power and we call for the Holy Ghost fire. Holy Ghost fire. The fire of God that transforms our hearts, Lord. All that truly causes us to be born again. I come against all the separation and because on the day of Pentecost, it was a gathering. Devil, you're not going to rob. You're not going to take this away from us as we gather, as we gather. Because when we gather, we have power. Oh, I thank you for the power of God being released today, right now, Father. Oh, help our leadership. Lord, we pray. God, give our president, our, our governors, our mayors, our police department. God, they all need your wisdom. They need your help right now. Oh, Father, we cry out, heal our land. Heal our land, Lord. You are the only answer. There is no way. There is no other truth. There is no other life. It is only through Yeshua. You are the only way. And God, we cry out. We cry out, God, heal our land. Heal our land, Lord, because you are the answer. Oh, Father, use us. Use us during this time to be a voice, a voice, God, in, in the places that you put each one of us in authority. Use our mouth. Lord, this is the year of pay. That's what you said. We're to speak the word of God. We're to speak the miracles of God. We're to speak the transformation of, of the Holy Spirit. You've anointed our mouths, God. Let us begin to use our mouths right now to win the lost. It's time for souls to be saved. There's a harvest. The harvest is ripe. The harvest is ripe. And we call in the harvest right now. Souls, come forth. Souls, come forth right now. We call it in. Oh, this is the time of the wheat harvest. And we thank you, Lord, for multiple souls, just like it was the first on the day of Pentecost. When Peter preached that sermon after he was born again, there were souls saved. And I thank you, Lord, for souls to be saved. Through all of this chaos, souls will be saved. Because, God, you will get the glory. You will get the honor. The devil will not win. He loses. And we declare God's souls right now, this weekend. Souls today. Souls tomorrow. Souls this whole season of Pentecost. We thank you, Lord, for souls and for our family's salvation. We cry out for our families, Lord. And for South Florida, we cry out, God, souls, souls, souls. And we pray for our Brian, Lord. Our, our, I mean, our Brad, Lord. We pray for Brad and Brian. But we pray for Brad, God, as he's on the police department. Use him, God, for your glory. He's your authority. He's your representative. Fill his mouth with the Holy Ghost. 
let the, his very countenance shine forth the light of Yeshua everywhere he goes, that they're going to see something different about him. Lord, I thank you for supernatural discernment and wisdom as he is about the streets of South Florida. Thank you for your hedge of protection in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. And bless our Brian if he has to be deployed to in the National Guard. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. God is good. Amen. Amen. Well, happy Pentecost. We're going to celebrate that when the word was first given, of course, to Israel, the Torah, and then in the book of Acts, when it was written on the hearts of the people. We're so thankful on, and that the word has been written on your heart. And I want to encourage you to pay attention to the, what the Holy Spirit's telling you during these, this time. The Lord gave me this statement. He said, I'll give wealth transfer in the middle of spiritual chaos. And that's what we're seeing, spiritual chaos. I know there's things going on in the natural, but remember, what's happening in the natural is a manifestation of what's going on in the spirit world. You need to know that. That the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? But against principalities, rulers of darkness, wickedness in high places. So whatever chaos goes on in the earth, and even in these three months time that we've been going, it was going on in the spirit, okay? But as children of God, we have authority, we have discernment, we have God's wisdom and he wants us to use it. And so he, I'm reading, you know, I'm reading through the Bible again and he brought me, I'm in 1 Samuel and he was bringing me to the story of when the Ark of the Covenant was stolen by the Philistines. They came in and they stole the Ark of the Covenant. And the enemy thought that when they took that Ark, because they had they had actually taken the most powerful thing from Israel, the presence of God. And you know, we need to think about that too. What is the most powerful thing in your life? It's not your job, it's not your money, it's not any, any of that. It's not even your, your husband, wife, or children. The most powerful thing in your life is the presence yeah. of God. So when they took that ark, they thought, they, you know what? Now we've done it. We've, we've taken them captive. And they placed the ark in front of their God. And their God's name was Dagon. And when you go to Ashdod in Israel, you can actually see this God. And this is where they all lived. <laughs> okay, when all this was happening. And in 1 Samuel chapter 5, it said, But when the Ashdodites, the Ashdod people, arose early the next morning, to everyone's surprise, their Dagon God had fallen to his face on the ground before the ark of Adonai. So they took Dagon up and put him back in place. But when they arose early the following morning, surprisingly, Dagon had fallen to his face on the ground before the ark of Adonai, and the head of Dagon and both palms of his hands were cut off on the threshold. Only Dagon's trunk was left on him. So they were really stupid enough to put the ark of the covenant in front of their God. And of course it fell and, and bowed down. And then in 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 6, it said, Then the hand of Adonai was heavy upon the Ashdodites, ravishing them and afflicting Ashdod with tumors. So the whole group starts breaking out with tumors, okay? And they became afraid because it was on all of the kings and their leaders, you know, tumors everywhere. So they decided, you know what? We need to get this ark out of here. <laughs> we need to send this ark back. So they called for their religious false worshipers and they asked, what do we need to do to get this ark out of here? And, it, and they said, after the chest of God had been among the Philistines, people for when they'd been there for seven months, the Philistine leaders called together their religious professionals and priests and experts on their supernatural uh, consolation. How can we get rid of this chest of God? Get it off our hands without making things worse. Tell us, they said, 
If you're going, and this is what they said, if you're going to send the chest of God of Israel back, don't just dump it on them. Pay compensation. Then you will be healed. After you're in the clear again, God will let up on you. Why wouldn't he? So basically they said, you better not just dump that ark. You better send some compensation. So what did they do? They went and got gold. And they made five gold rats, which I think is hysterical. You know, and um, they and five gold tumors. The five rats represented the five kings of the Philistines, okay? The five tumors represented the cities that they ruled in. So they put this gold can you imagine they made it they molded it and they and they put this on a cart a new cart they put the ark on it and then they put this gold tumors and these gold mice you know with it and they said okay we're going to position this ark to go towards Beth Shemesh this direction because that's where the Israelites live and if the cows actually go there we know that this is God. But if they turn to the side and they don't go, then we know that all these things that have happened to us is just mere coincidence, okay? So I was telling Pastor Ken about this, and he said to me, I said, Beth Shemesh, you know, I said, it, isn't it amazing that they sent it to that city? And so he says to me, well, guess what Beth Shemesh means? Beth means house. Shem means name. Esh means fire. So the house name is fire. So they're sending the ark, okay, to a city that means fire. Now, as the ark is going towards them, this is where the wealth transfer comes in. The Lord began to show me that the Israelites were not hiding out from the Philistines. They were not hiding. They were not afraid. The Bible says, now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. What is wheat harvest? What are we celebrating today? Pentecost. Is it any accident that they went to the house of what? Fire? Okay, there's no coincidence with God. Everything in the word, we've learned this from Pastor Ken, has a meaning. So the Lord said to me, look at Israel. They're continuing. They're continuing. They're working. They're in the field. It's wheat time. The harvest is coming. They're, they're getting in their wheat. They're, they're not responding to, to the Philistines, even though they've captured the ark. They're continuing to do what I commanded them to do. And so... This is what the Lord said. Tell the people of Save the Nations. I'm the one who takes care of you. Keep doing what you're doing. Don't stop working. Don't get distracted with all this chaos. They were not distracted. It was wheat time. It was harvest time. They weren't hiding. They were out gathering the wheat. What did God tell us? Wealth transfer. He said during this season, there's a wealth transfer. With all this chaos going on, God says there's a wealth transfer. The people of Beth Shemesh, they look up and they see. What do they see? The ark of God coming into their house. Look up. Look up. The presence of God is in your house. It's in your house. The blessing is in your house. God says, keep doing what you're doing. Now they kept working, but what else does wheat represent? Souls. So it's time. With all this chaos going on, you need to win the lost. Now's the time to share the gospel. Now's the time to tell people the Lord is coming back. And he's coming back really, really soon. It's, it's, we're right there. He's coming back. And you need to ask your family members, are you ready? If the Lord would come today, will you go? You need to say it just like that. Are you ready? Because it's time. It's time. So God says to this house, wealth transfer. I put my presence in your house. I put my fire inside of your heart. Now all you got to do is reap it. Amen? Amen? Continue to do what you're doing. Don't get caught up with everything that's going on. Don't hide. Don't retreat. 
You keep, you stay on course. Why? Because what are you doing? You're saying, I put my trust in the Lord. I put my trust in the Lord. I put my trust in the Lord. And just like Beth Shemus, do you think those people realized that the presence of God was coming to their house that day? No, they, they just were in obedience. Just like many of you, you've been coming, you've been obedient. You're like, I'm doing this by faith. And that's why you're reaping the blessings. That's why God is pouring it out on you. That's why he's speaking to you. He's preventing you from making mistakes. He's telling you, don't buy that house, right? Don't do that. Why? Because you're, you have stayed steady. So I'm telling you, God's put his fire inside of you. And his wealth transferred. You receive that today. Keep doing what you're doing. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Pentecost. We are the house. My name is Esh. Do you believe you need to say that? My name is Esh. I have the fire. The fire of the Holy Ghost lives on the inside of me. And I will have wealth transfer. Grab hold of it today. All right, let's give to the celebrating Shavuot or Pentecost today. And today we are going to talk about revival or being revived mouth to mouth. Mouth to everyone say mouth to mouth. Mouth to mouth. Just think about that mouth to mouth. Um, because we're going to look at that today. If you don't have a paper, Amanda will make sure you get one or just uh, they're, they're in the back. Or I believe everyone has it. Pastor Lisa, of course, she almost preached my whole sermon before I even got up here, which is fine. We are in the Hebrew calendar 5780. It's been declared the year of the mouth because the numeric value of the Hebrew letter is 80. It's 80 and it's pay. And pay also means mouth. So 80 is the numeric value for the letter pay. But the letter pay actually means mouth in Hebrew. And so even the Hebrew letter looks like a mouth. I, I, I put a picture on there so you could look at it. You can see the mouth. You can see even possibly a tongue. And so we are living in a prophetic time right now where we learned in scripture last week that when a person has a spiritual disease called leprosy, one of the... Um, one of the things that you would do is that you would cover your mouth. They would, you would shield your mouth. You would mask your mouth. I mean, if that's not, um, if you can't see how that kind of ties in with where we're living today. It's, and it's um, one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why people would get leprosy and then would have to cover their mouth according to the scriptures is because they had spoken evil against authority. So like when Miriam spoke against uh, Miriam and Aaron and together, they spoke against Moses because he had married an Ethiopian woman. They didn't like that. Well, when that happened, she came down with leprosy. And leprosy, remember, you don't get healed of leprosy. You get cleansed of leprosy because leprosy is a spiritual disease. It's a, it's a spiritual uncleanness, if you will, that manifests in your body. Okay, so I, I want you to um, look in the book of James now because today we're going to be talking about the mouth or pay and James chapter 3 teaches us this in verse 5 through 10 it says so the tongue is a small part of the body yet it carries a great power or dominion just think, and that's in the Aramaic though it doesn't just carry power but the tongue could dominate just think of how a small flame can set a huge force ablaze and the tongue is a fire it's an esh it can be compared to the sum total of wickedness and is the most dangerous part of our human body. It corrupts the entire body and is a hellish flame. It releases a fire that can burn throughout the course of human existence. Literally, in, 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 the, in the Greek, it says the tongue can cause things that can go from one generation to the next. What, a, what your mouth can release can actually affect generations to come that's what it means there verse 7 for every wild animal on earth including bee birds creeping reptiles and creatures of the sea and land all have been overpowered and tamed by humans but 
The tongue is not able to be tamed. It is fickle, unrestrained evil that spews out words full of toxic poison. Number nine, we use our tongue to praise God our Father and then turn around and curse a person who is made in his very image. Out of the south, same mouth, look at that mouth, remember it, pay. Out of the same mouth, we pour out words of praise one minute and curses the next. My brothers and sisters, this should never be. So remember, we've been teaching you at Save the Nations that every word that we're studying, whether it's in the Hebrew or the Greek, has multiple meanings and has two sides to it. A positive, a negative. A side for good and a side for evil. So think about this. When God spoke to Moses, Moses goes to the backside of a desert. He sees a bush burning with fire, right? And he says, I must turn aside to see the voice that speaks to me out of the fire. There was a voice. He cried out, Moses, Moses. The voice spoke through the fire. That's a good thing. God, God can use fire in a positive way. He can speak to you through fire. He can give you his fire. You know, Jeremiah says, your word was like fire. Shut up in my bones. And God, but there's another side of that fire where that same fire could, the same word fire, can now be used to curse people, to harm people, to dominate people. And then he said, you, could, you should not use the fire of words for that purpose. Is it possible? Yes. Is it right? No. Do you see that? So we need to, to start thinking about that. Words carry power. The Hebrew understanding of words is words connect the natural realm to the spiritual realm. Words are used in both realms. Words on earth give you access to the spirit realm. Words in heaven give you access to the earth realm. It's a means of exchange, if you will. Words, if you will, are containers of power. Think about it. A word is a container of power. It could be a good power. It could be an evil power. It could be a power to bless. It could be a power to curse. It could be a power to heal. It could be a power to make sick. But it's still a word is a container. So you have to be careful what comes out of what? Your mouth. Now we know Proverbs says death and life are in the power of that word power there is in the, is a, in the Hebrew, it's the word hand. It's in the hand of the tongue. Satan spoke words in the scripture. We can find when Satan speaks. And Satan uses words to rail against God. So he'll use words because what is he trying to do? He's trying to access into the spiritual realm. He's trying to change things that he sees happening in the natural realm. So what did he do? He would rail against God. And you'll see this even in the book of Jude. It talks about, 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 the, about Satan railing and speaking. But also in the book of Isaiah, it says, um, Satan said, I will exalt myself. I will be like the Most High. I will sit on the the Moed. I will control the seasons and time. He spoke why? Because he was releasing words in the atmosphere as a fire, if you will. Now some of you don't realize how powerful your words are. Now even if even regular normal people that don't believe in the Bible, they know what's called a self fulfilling prophecy. It is not it is not Christian people I'm talking about. You can go to any school or psychology, they'll talk about say it, speak it, declare it. When you say something, you're actually bringing that thing into your life. Where are they getting that from? The scripture. They don't realize it. So, words are powerful. Genesis 11 verse 6. The people spoke something. 
They said, let us build a tower to reach heaven. They spoke the words on earth and that those words got God's attention. It shows you right there how words carry weight and how they access both realms. Genesis 11, 6. And the Lord said, Behold, there is one race and one lip of all. In the Hebrew, that's what it says. Sometimes it, you'll read it says language, but actually the people didn't just have the same language. It was the same lip. They had the same mouth, if you will. They have begun to do this. And now nothing shall fail from them of all that they may have undertaken to do. What gave the people in the book of Genesis when they left chapter 11, when they wanted to build the tower, what gave them their authority? Their words, their speech. They said, let us build. They begin to use their mouth and their mouth gave them authority or to dominate and they actually were going to build this tower to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that they couldn't do it. God comes down, confounds their language and he says, because their people have one lip and one speech, nothing that they want to do can, can be hindered. They can do it. Think about how powerful that is. The power of words, if the people speak the same thing, the same lip, and they agree that they're going to do something, he said, it's going to happen. That's crazy, right? Think about this. In the garden, Satan tempted Eve with words that were deceiving and did not align to the truth that was spoken by Elohim. What was she tempted with? Did God really say? He, he was twisting the, what came out of God's mouth. He was twisting her ability to even hear what God had said. And so, if, if this is the year of the mouth, if it is, Pastor Lisa said it was at the beginning, I didn't tell her what I was preaching on. If this is the year of the mouth, then we too will be tempted in what we speak with our mouth and our lips. We will be tempted just like Eve to not speak in alignment with the word of God. To speak the wrong thing. Because when you declare and speak the wrong thing, you can actually bring the wrong thing into existence. Look in Psalms 141, verse 3. So maybe you're like, Is that, can this really happen? Is this really true? Psalms 141, verse 3. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth, over my pay. Keep watch over the door of my lips. What does a door do? It gives entry. It gives access. A door has a threshold. You can cross over and get in through that door. Or a door can be a place where you lock the door and you say, no, you can't enter here. How many corners does a door have? Think about it. How many, how many corners does a door have? Four corners, right? How many corners are on the altar? Four corners. An altar is a door. It's a place of entry, of access. Hallelujah. It can bring blessings, but in the revelation, we're going to see the four, that's what's called, and we talked about it, we'll talk about it next week. It's called the altar judgments. Because the same, that altar is a door, and that door is going to bring judgment to the people that don't obey God. Just wanted to throw you out. Okay. So now, the door or your lips or your tongue is a place of authority to permit or deny. Have you taught your children to say no? Have you taught yourself to say no? What's sometimes the hardest word to say? 
You don't want to do it. You don't want to go there. You know it's, you don't even feel right about it, but they're pressuring you. Have you ever felt that? I see AJ shaking his head. It's Brittany, she's pushing me. I know. It's fair enough her mom. No. <laughs> now, think about it. Think about it. Tongue, authority, permission, granted, permission, denied. And it is very hard to say no. But part of the realignment that's happening in the world today and what God wants to do in all his people, we have to learn to guard the door of our lips. And we can't always say yes when God is saying no. So we need to align with the truth of the word. If God said no, we got to say no. If God says yes, we can say yes. So it's just, it's just, um, now go to the next page. Look at Proverbs 13, verse 2. The one who is careful what he says will have good come to him. But the one who wants to hurt others will have trouble. How are they going to have trouble? Because they spoke trouble. He who watches over his mouth keeps his life. He who opens his lips wide will be destroyed. Very, that's, that's pretty strong words. So you got to be careful. you got to guard your lips. Now we know James says no one can even do this. Um, he says the tongue is just will do whatever it wants to do. But he's, he's not telling you there yet the answer. Because the answer to control the tongue is going to be the Holy Spirit. The person of the Holy Spirit is the only one that can help you guard your tongue. How many people can say amen to that? So what should be coming out of your lips? What should be coming out of your mouth? This altar, this door, if you will. Psalm 68 verse 11 says, The Lord gives the word and a great army brings the good news. Literally, they bring the gospel. The Lord gives the word and the army or the people, what, what happens? They proclaim it. They give the good news. So he's trying, it's a hint there that we as God's people, we have to speak the gospel or the good news. We've got it. The Lord gave the word. Now we just simply rehearse that same thing that he said. Whatever God said, he gave the word and the army, they proclaimed it. That's what God said. What did God say? This is what God said. You don't have to come up with your own words. I don't come up with my own words. All we do as believers, we don't, it's like, I don't know what to say. We have 66 books of what to say. You don't have to come up with your own words. He said, the Lord gave the word and great is the company that published it. It's good news. Just give the good news that God said to give. So look at Nahum chapter one, verse 15. Behold on mountains, the feet of him who brings what? Good news. It's a Hebrew word, basar. Who publishes peace or shalom. Then he says, keep your feast, Judah. Perform your vows for the wicked one will no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. Now somehow the good news is going to be tied in with the feast days. Tied into Keeping God's appointed times is going to help proclaim good news. We know every feast day is good news for the believer. We know every feast day points to an aspect of the gospel. Passover points to salvation. Unleavened bread points to sanctification. First fruits pe uh, points to resurrection and new life. Pentecost points to God's authority, the authority of his word and his spirit. I mean, everyone... It's good news. It's good news. We proclaim good news. Look in Isaiah chapter 52. Therefore my people will know my name. Therefore in that day I am the one who will be saying Hineni, which is here am I. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him who brings what? 
good news, who announces shalom, who brings the good news of happiness, who announces salvation, literally, that word salvation there is the same word, the same name as our Savior, Yeshua. The one who says Yeshua, who says salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. That's good news. Ultimately, what should be coming out of the pay during this season? The gospel, the good news. God reigns. He has authority. There's no other way to get to God. His salvation. No other name given among men whereby we must be saved. The name of Yeshua. The name of Jesus. We declare that. According to the scriptures, those who follow Yeshua the Son and Yahweh the Father will have something in common that will be in the mouth. Look in Exodus 13. So it will be a sign on your hand and a reminder between your eyes so that the Torah of Adonai may be in your mouth. With a strong hand, Adonai has brought you out of Egypt. And that was... That, that context there was talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. When you keep that feast, it's like, it's like putting the word on your forehead and on your hands and on. And the Torah was going to be in your mouth. Look in Joshua 1.8. The book of the Torah should not depart from your pay, from your mouth. What am I going to speak? The good news. What am I going to speak? The word. The Torah. You are to meditate on it day and night. You shall be careful to do everything written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will be successful. The book of Job says this. It says, verse 22-22. Uh, Receive now Torah from his mouth and lay up his words in thy lev or thy heart. Psalms 119.72 says, the Torah from your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Romans 10 says, but what does it say? The word is near you in your, where? Your mouth. Same word, pay, would be if it was in Hebrew. And in your heart, that is the word of faith that we are proclaiming. For if you confess with your mouth, how are, whoa, that Yeshua is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. How do you get saved? You've got to confess with your mouth the word of salvation. Yes. For with your heart it's belief for righteousness and with the mouth, with the mouth, with the pay, it is confessed for salvation. You have to use your mouth. Everyone just knows that the scripture says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what does that tell you? You have to use your mouth pay your mouth you have oh that's so amazing now look at numbers chapter 12 are you ready Yahweh, no, Numbers 12, 4 through 8. Yahweh spoke suddenly to Moses, to Aaron, to Miriam. You three come out to the tent of meeting. The three of them came out. Yahweh came down in a pillar of cloud. He stood at the door of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forward. They were having a come to Yahweh meeting. He said, now hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, Yahweh, will make myself known to him in a vision. I will speak to him in a dream. My servant is not so. But excuse me. My servant Moses is not so. He's not just a prophet. He is faithful in all my health. With him I will speak mouth to mouth. Even plainly and not in riddles. And you shall see Yahweh's form. For why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant against, uh, uh, my servant against Moses? I read this many times before and I happened to mention this on the prayer call on Wednesday night about Moses received the word from God the Torah from God he received it mouth to mouth after the prayer call was over Pastor Lisa says do you even know what you're saying do you understand what you're talking about I was like no can you please explain it to me yes. Holy Spirit <laughs> And so we had a we had a, a discussion. I was like, oh my God, uh, my goodness, I gotta study this out even more. Because this is not the same 
as the other prophets who wrote the scriptures, who received, you know, the book of Timothy, it says all scriptures God breathed, right? Right? And it talks about the prophets received that word and they, they penned it. But here it says Moses receives the word mouth to pay to pay. Actually, it's a double in the Bible. It's a, if you read it in Hebrew, you'll see, um, I speak to Moses, pay, pay. The double. There's another time it's used, um, tri actually triplets, when God says, Moses is going to pay to you. And, uh, God, God says, I'm going to pay to Moses. Moses is going to pay to Aaron. And it's a triplet there. There's three pay, pay, pay. Um, so it's very interesting there. But So I begin to think about what does mouth to mouth make you think about what is that just that it makes me think about resuscitation when someone is dying or is is dead or they can't breathe what do you give them mouth to mouth resuscitation so that think about in that context that's how god gives moses the word he gives him it he breathes it if you will into moses mouth so i wrote this down about and i looked it up in in, in uh Internet, what mouth to mouth is. Mouth to mouth resuscitation, a form of artificial ventilation, is the act of assisting or stimulating respiration in which a rescuer presses their mouth against that of a victim and blows air into that person's lungs. Artificial respiration takes many forms but generally entails providing air for a person who is not breathing or is not making sufficient respiratory effort on their own. It is used on a patient with a beating heart as, or as a part of cardiopulmonary resuscitation to achieve the, etern the, the internal respiration. And some of you even probably learned how to do you know, CPR, the mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, where you're actually taking your breath and you're breathing into somebody else to get their heart and lungs working again. And in that sense, think about it. God is wanting to resuscitate humanity. How is he going to resuscitate humanity? He's going to breathe his word into them mouth to mouth. And I just think it's interesting. We're going to keep looking at that. And I was like, okay, well, where else in the scripture can I find a mouth to mouth? Is there other places where there is a mouth-to-mouth? -mouth? And we read in Job, talking about God giving the Torah from his mouth. But look in the book of 2 Kings. There's a child, a prophetic child that died. And if you, if, and, um, we won't go into all the details on it. But look, look what happens when the child dies. And his mother comes to the prophet. She just basically is undone before him. She doesn't even tell him what's wrong. But he knows something's happened. And he goes to her house. And so when Elisha, verse uh, 2 Kings 4, 32 through 35, when Elisha had come into the house, behold, the child was dead and lay lying on his bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door on them both and prayed to Yahweh. He went up and lay on the child. And look what happens. He put his mouth on his mouth. His eyes on his eyes. His hands on his hands. He stretched himself on him. And the child's flesh grew warm. Then he returned and walked in the house once back and forth. Went up, stretched himself out on him. That looks like he did it two times, right? Then the child sneezed seven times, and the child, it just so, so happens, seven times. And the child opened his eyes. So we see this proto-prophecy, if you will, where the man of God, in order to bring a resuscitation from something or someone that's dead, to bring a revival, there has to be a mouth-to-mouth between the prophetic, between the prophetic and the one who is dead, and the prophetic is going to breathe, if you will, into that dead thing or dead person, and that will come back to life. So there's a lot in that, 
But now go to the book of Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 and look at the creation of man. God creates man out of the dust, right? Out of the, 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 the ground, the clay, if you will. He forms man of the slime of the earth, Genesis 2, 7, and breathe into his face the breath of life and man became a living soul. So how does man come alive in the first place? The breath, the ruach, the wind of God gives that shell of a man life. What do you think happens to get Jesus raised from the dead? The Holy Spirit goes down to where he is. He's dead. His body is dead. He, he breathes. He gives him, if you will, a mouth to mouth. Hallelujah. He gives him a mouth to mouth because the scripture, the word said, Thou will not leave my soul in hell. You will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. The Holy Spirit took that word. He said, this is the word for you. <laughs> Receive it. And he was resuscitated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He was born again. He's the first born again, if you will. Now, John 20, 21 and 22. Yeshua said to them, Shalom Aleichem. Peace be unto you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And after he said this, what does he do? He, he breathed on them and he said to them, receive the Ruach, receive the Holy Spirit. Now remember, pay means mouth. Strong's Concordance says it's just not just the mouth, but it's the mouth as the means of blowing. Pay has a numeric value of 80, which is mouth or opening. But remember, the word for mouth in Hebrew is two letters. It's the letter pay, which means mouth, but it's also the letter hey, having a numeric value of five, which means breath movement of air or speaking. So even just the word mouth in the Hebrew, the two letters, pay and hey, oh, that's rhymes even, pay and hey, they have a meaning behind it of not just um, speaking, but also breathing. Breathing and a movement of air, a movement of spirit. Mouth, breathing out air. Now, let me just quickly talk about Pentecost because Pentecost is one of the three times of, ye of the year, the foot feast of Israel. They would go three times a year to Jerusalem to celebrate before the Lord. They would have the greatest time during Passover, during Pentecost. And during Sukkot, Passover, they would celebrate the barley harvest. On Pentecost, they would celebrate the wheat harvest. On, on, on Tabernacles, they would celebrate the, um, the fruit harvest, or the, the, the rest of the harvest, if you will. It always pointed, the, har the, the foot festivals always pointed to the fact that God took care of his people. Just say, God takes care of me. One of the reasons we align with God's feast is it's a sign to the nations. It's a it's a it's a light. It's a we're being that candle, that menorah that says when we do what God says, we never have to worry because God takes care of us. So much to the fact. Do you realize that when Israel would leave their home for these feasts, they'd be gone for quite some time, especially if they had a journey. Do you know God would protect their home? God would make sure the nations didn't attack them during those times. Why? Because they were. this was a sign. Uh, these feasts were a sign that God's with them. He cares about them. He loves them. But since we're in the wheat harvest right now, one of the things I want you to just mark this down. Right there, I, think I wrote it down, so we'll just read it in a second. The wheat at Shavuot was significant because wheat in the Bible is associated with people. The wheat harvest was gathered at, and the first fruits were offered with two big loaves of leavened bread, 
accompanied by the blood of seven lambs, one bull and two rams. Ten. There was ten total offerings. Blood, blood offerings, if you will. We know ten is the number of commandment. We know that ten is the number that, that really um, signifies the, the word of God, the commandments of God. They would, they would give this offering with salt, ground, wheat, flour, and wine. They would be what's called an elevation offering, a resurrection offering. A, they would also give a sin offering and a peace offering. I mean, this is no joke. They, I mean, God was very specific that they would take care of the sin. They would take care of, they would, they would take care of what's called the resurrection offering. We would see it in the Bible, it would say burnt offering. In the Hebrew, it's called Ola. It's an elevation offering. Basically, God say, I'm, I'm taking you higher. I want you, to, I want you to be with me. I'm, I'm receiving it. It was a type of future resurrection. Peace offering. You would have peace with God, but you'd have peace with people. You, you have nothing is by accident. If God has sin, takes care of your sin. Elevation takes care of, I want you to draw close to me. I want to be gathered near you. I and mean, every one of that peace offering, you're going to have shalom. God, peace with God, peace with man. The, every, the name of the offering is what it meant. Is the meaning behind it. Just I'm throwing a lot out at you, but I know you're catching it. The word offering actually means to draw closer to God through relationship. Remember, how is an offering giving? It's given on an altar. An altar is a door. An altar is a place of exchange. Okay, let me throw this out at you that you never thought about this. It's not really about that, uh, what you're putting on the altar. It's really the act of your will and heart that God's looking for. You doing what he said, he says, now I know your mind. Because half the stuff that he says, it makes no sense to the natural mind. I mean, I can explain it to you now, but you, most people are like, well, well, God said, give seven this, three this, two, I don't know why. But they did it. And God said, because you did it, I know your heart. Hallelujah. Now, the people would not eat of the next harvest until one thing happened. It's called the first fruit offering. So at Passover, they wouldn't eat the barley until they what? First, when Yeshua was resurrected, he's the first fruit of the barley. They had to partake of, they had to give God first what belonged to him. On Shavuot, it's a time that they're gathering the wheat harvest, but they're not going to eat first. What are they going to do first? They're going to give God a, they're going to weigh that offering to the Lord first. Then they're going to partake of it. It's a principle. All throughout the Bible, God gets the first, God gets the best. You get to eat. We get to eat and eat up. And you know I like to eat. We can eat a lot. He's not holding back on us. Nowhere in the scripture where God says he just gives you enough. You will find that in the Bible. Amen. Amen. All right. When they did reap, God said one other thing. I don't want you to reap the whole harvest. I want you to leave the corners for those who are hurting, for those who are poor. This should always remind us when God blesses us, we don't, take, we don't eat it all and we don't give it all even back to him. There is a portion for those who are hurting. Amen, Pastor. Yes. That's why I love our church. Because we do this. I want you to know we do this. Not just... There, we do this all the time because this is the right way. It's not just for us. Thank God for his blessings. Thank God for his faithfulness. But we always leave the corners. <laughs> you know what the word corners in that translation, in, in the Hebrew actually is? Pay. Pay up. Mouth. You know what? They have to have something to eat. Makes sense, right? What did Jesus say in Isaiah 61? You got to preach the gospel to the poor. Good news has to come to the poor. What does that mean? There's a place for you to come, even on the corners. The book of Ruth is read during Pentecost. What does she do? She gleans the corners of the fields of heavenly Boaz, a type of Messiah. Because there's always room for people to come. Under his corners. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I want to show you something. 
Are you getting anything out of this? Yeah. Okay, I, I hope you are. I, I, let me give you a final insight to what's happening prophetically right now, this season that we're in, because I want you to, to really get this. And if you've ever felt in your life that you've come under any type of attack or opposition, you're going to see why in the scriptures very clearly. Does anybody ever feel like you're under attack? Do you feel like, you, like the devil just doesn't like what you're, you're like? Like, why are you getting that resistance? And you're especially going to get it when you come close to God's appointed times. You're going to get it even more. But I want you to see in Luke 22, verse 31 through 34. Here's Jesus talking. Peter, my dear friend, listen to what I'm about to tell you. Satan has demanded to come and sift you like wheat and test your faith. What is wheat? Wheat is a person, but wheat has to do with the Pentecost harvest. Satan wants to sift you so you don't produce. So you're not there. You're not doing what you should be doing. You are sifted. You are gone through a sieve. You, and it's not God sifting. It's Satan sifting. He's testing you. He's demanded, or one, one translation says he's asked permission. There's now we can talk about this and we can study it, but there are things that God allows in the Bible. There are things that happen in your life that God can't stop from happening. He permits it as a door. One reason he permits it is because you have already made it where God can't protect you or stop that. Like Job, for instance. Satan comes to God. He says, uh, you got this hedge around Job. And, and, you know, if I, you know, but if you take that hedge down, I, I'll, um, you know, I'll show you what Job's made out of. And God said, what? He's already in your power. You say, well, did God must have did it. No, the Bible says this. The Bible says that when Job was offering offerings for his kids, he said, I knew this would happen. The thing that I feared has what? Come upon me. Fear can open the door to things. God can stop that. I'm just saying, there's many reasons. I'm just giving you one. So now, why is it going to happen to Peter? Well, we'll find out. Meanwhile, Peter's standing in the court. Okay, so 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 saints come to you. Come like to test your face for faith. Verse thirty-two. But I pray for you, Peter, that you should stay faithful to me no matter what comes. Remember this: after you have turned back to me, after you one translation says, after you've been converted and have been restored, make it your life mission to strengthen the faith of your brothers. But Lord, Peter replied. I'm ready to stand with you to the very end, even if it means prison or death. Jesus looked at him and prophesied, before the rooster crows in the morning, you will deny three times that you ever knew me. How many times does Peter fall? Three times. He uses his pay, his mouth, to curse and to swear, and he does exactly what Jesus said he'll do. What do we learn about the pay? What should Peter be speaking? The word, the gospel, the good news. What happens to Peter? Satan tries to get him from speaking the right thing. And what is he speaking now? The very opposite. Look in, look in John 18. Meanwhile, Peter was standing in the courtyard by the fire. Oh, by the fire. And one of the guards standing him said to him, aren't you one of his disciples? I know you are, Peter swore, and said, I'm not his disciple. Number one. One of his servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, looked at him and said, wait, didn't I see you out there in the garden? Peter denied it the third time and said, no. And at that very moment, very same moment, a rooster crowed nearby. 
Your mouth should be used to preach the word. Peter is a great example of what's going to happen at this time. What can happen to any one of us at this time. We should be speaking what God said. We should be proclaiming the gospel. But instead, we're cursing. I don't know. I don't know about this Jesus stuff. Or you're not, you're not doing, you're not speaking the right thing. You're speaking the wrong thing. Now let's not dog Peter. Because we could all be like Peter at times. Can I have an amen from the peanut gallery? And I could be the chief one. I admit it. I could be the same way. But after the resurrection, Peter has an encounter with Jesus. He has what I'll call a come to Yahweh, a come to Jesus meeting. And Peter and Jesus talk and Peter is given another chance. And Jesus says three times, for the three times that he did the wrong thing, he said, Peter, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. And so Peter has a conversion, if you will. He has a change of mind, if you will. Now, what ultimately was Satan trying to do? What was, what was he going to do to sift Peter? How was he going to sift him? What do you think he would do? Not just to get him to curse Jesus. But not to be where Jesus told them to be when the Holy Spirit was going to be poured out on the day of Pentecost. The way he wanted to sift Peter, not just get him to pay and speak curses, but to make sure Peter did not show up at the divine Moedim. Don't be there, Peter. And can you imagine? If you curse Jesus, the tendency is like, okay, I curse Jesus. Jesus don't want anything to do with me now. But because Peter had an encounter with Jesus, Peter obviously repented. We don't see it with him say that, but we know it happened because who is going to be at the upper room with 120? Who's going to be there? And who's going to stand up and use his pay, his mouth, to now preach the very gospel? And 3,000 people get saved. Who's going to be? Peter. Is God the God of a second chance? And a third chance? And a fourth? And a fifth? And a sixth? And all that? Yes! He wants to use our mouth, but I want you to be aware, just like Peter, Satan wants to sift you, to get you where you're just nothing. You're, you're like... You can't do you can't do what God wants you to do. You're not at the right place. You're not at the right time. You're not with the right people. You're not doing the right thing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. What happens on the day of Pentecost? I'll give you the, the quick version. Deuteronomy chapter 4 talks about how God came down from the mountain with fire and he spoke. To the people who were there. And he gave them his word. They, they, they saw the commandments written by the finger of God. Moses had gotten that word from God. Mouth to mouth. Now on the day of Pentecost. In the upper room. In Acts chapter 2. You'll see the same smoke. The same fire. The same wind. The same voice of God. That physically wrote the word. On tablets. Now takes that word. And he, everyone in that upper room got a mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation from God himself. Let me put it another way. When someone gets born again, they get mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. He puts his breath, he puts his spirit, he puts his, oh, hallelujah. How powerful is that to know that what you got, you got from God himself. Yes. There's no, do you understand? There's no man 
rep woman representative that you have to go between to hear God's word. You got a mouth to mouth. Hallelujah.